Let us now read God's word in John chapter 12. John 12, verses 1 through 19. John 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone, against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always have ye with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave, and raised him from the dead, bear record. This caused the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how we prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. Amen. <coughs> Christ's resurrection of Lazarus in the previous chapter, John 11, was, from many perspectives, the greatest miracle of our Lord's earthly ministry. After all, he raised a dead person to life. He didn't really merely bring a sick person back to health or a maimed person back to the full use of all of his limbs, but someone who was dead now lives again. Moreover, of the three resurrections performed by Jesus and recorded in the Gospel accounts, that of Lazarus was the most wonderful. Jairus' daughter, she lay on her bed, having just died. The widow of Nain's son lay in his open coffin on the way to his burial. But Lazarus, he lay in his sepulcher, being dead for four days. And as one said on that celebrated occasion, by this time he stinketh. And Jesus raised him from the dead. Now compared to these other two resurrections, 
That of Lazarus is also far more detailed in Holy Scripture. The raising of Lazarus gets a whole chapter, John 11, and not merely a part of it, as with the other two resurrections. That chapter is one of the longest in the first four books of the New Testament. 57 verses on the resurrection of Lazarus and related events. And then Lazarus' resurrection receives treatment in about a third of the next chapter, John 12, which part we read earlier, the first 19 verses. This raising of Lazarus is also the resurrection and indeed the miracle of Jesus which had the most effect. And there were loads of them. This one. This was the one that received more attention than any other, and that in part because it took place near Jerusalem and not long before the Passover when the capital city was packed with pilgrims. And then there was also Lazarus's role the raised from the dead Lazarus, his role as a witness through whom many converts were made. John 12 verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that Christ was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only but that they might see Lazarus also. He was a large secondary attraction. The people wanted to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And then verse 11 adds, By reason of Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And there's nothing like this said of anyone else healed or raised from the dead just Lazarus that crowds came to see him too not only Jesus and many people were converted through his witness in fact so successful was the witness of the risen Lazarus that the Jewish religious leaders not only decided that they had to kill Jesus but that they also had to kill Lazarus verse 10 the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. And again I say, we don't read that of anyone else whom Jesus healed or raised. And by the way, these chief priests who consulted to kill Lazarus, they were Sadducees. And the Sadducees denied the resurrection of the body. And so they wanted to put Lazarus to death too because there he was walking around Jerusalem and its environs risen from the dead. And that's the end of their dogma. So that's another reason why they have to kill him in their thinking at least. This resurrection of Lazarus in John 11 leads us to two other scenes. We have the anointing of Jesus by Martha, by Mary rather, Lazarus's sister at the meal in their house in John 12 verses 1 through 8 and then Christ's triumphal entry verses 12 through 19 our text this morning and so we see more widely that the resurrection of Lazarus led actually to our Savior's cross and it did that chronologically and also causally the one who raised Lazarus from the dead must die. And with our text this morning, we come to Christ's Passion Week. Passion here meaning suffering, his week especially of suffering. Christ's Passion Week begins with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a Sunday, the last Sunday of his ministry. It includes the Thursday night, the Last Supper, which we will celebrate in the form of the Lord's Supper 
shortly. The Friday of his crucifixion, and then the next Sunday, his resurrection from the dead, because he who raised Lazarus was able in a few short days to raise himself. Not on the fourth day, that's Lazarus, but on the third day. Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on this Sunday, at the very beginning of the Passion Week, is one of the few incidents that's recorded in all four of the Gospel accounts, like the feeding of the 5,000. And so in our treatment of Christ's triumphal entry this morning, we're going to focus mainly on John 12, the passage we read, but we'll also draw on some of the other elements mentioned in the other accounts. Let's consider together then Christ's triumphal entry, first noting that the crowds rejoice, and second, that the Pharisees despair. And third, that the disciples understand. They understood more than most people on that day, but they understood way more later on after Jesus was glorified. Christ's triumphal entry, the response of three different parties, the crowds, they rejoice. The Pharisees, they despair. And the disciples, they understand. What then happened on that morning of that Sunday of the Passion Week? Well, the Lord Jesus, he journeyed roughly a couple of miles or so, heading west towards Jerusalem. He went through Bethany, a little town or village, then to Bethphage where he sent two of his disciples with instructions to get him a donkey, upon which he rode up to the top of the Mount of Olives and then down the other side into the Kidron Valley and then up a bit and through the gate into the city of Jerusalem. Now Jesus did not merely make this journey on his own, or even with the 12 disciples in attendance, there were a large number of people with him and lining the way. In fact, you could even say that there were two crowds. There were people who came out of Jerusalem towards the west in order to meet him because they heard that he was coming. And then there were other people who were with him as he headed east And then some of those who came and met him then joined the caravan, headed west, and entered the city. And the various accounts teach this, including John. Verse 12 says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, and so are in Jerusalem, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem from the east, They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. Verse 17. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, they bear record or witness to the other people that they met about Christ raising that man from a state of death. For this cause, the people also met him, came to greet Jesus, For that they had heard that he had done this miracle. So some of the crowd then went before him and some went after him in this great procession up to the holy city. What then did the crowds do that day? Well, they cast things on the road in front of Jesus. You understand, I'm just relating the facts now. I'll explain these things more fully later. Two things, garments of clothing. The other three accounts mention those. And then branches. John tells us that the branches of the trees that were strewn in front of him, which presumably the thicker part of the branch 
on the outside of the, the, the road that these were palm branches. And the casting of the clothes and the palm branches in front of Jesus, we'll say a lot more about this later, was to honour him. What then did the crowds say? John records this in verse 13. Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And similar and additional things are ascribed to the shouts of the crowd in Matthew, Mark and Luke. The passage also tells us the attitude or the mood of the crowd. It wasn't hostile. It was jubilation. They were rejoicing in Jesus. Luke 19 verse 37 says, The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Why were they doing these things? The very surface of the narrative gives us the answer, though we're going to go deeper later. <coughs> they did this because of whom they believed Jesus to be. The crowd in verse 13 call him blessed. They said Jesus is peculiarly blessed of God, and we bless him too. This is the crowd, of course, that's going to cry later on. Crucify him, crucify him, but now they're blessing him. They call him again in verse 13, the king of Israel. He is our king. He's going to be the king in Jerusalem. Then he's going to be the king of the promised land, because Jerusalem is the capital of the whole land, and presumably two of the pilgrims who have come up from the Jewish diaspora in the Middle East and in the Roman Empire. Big claims. They call Jesus, he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He is the representative of the one true living God. And he is the one who is going especially to act on his behalf. And as I mentioned when we sang Psalm 40, they're ascribing to Jesus the messianic title, the coming one. Another phrase for the Christ, the coming one. Because the Old Testament predicted the first coming of Jesus and the New Testament predicts the second coming of Jesus. They said that he was the one predicted in the Old Testament scriptures in Psalm 118 because verse 13 quotes that psalm. We're going to sing it later. And they were thereby saying, Jesus, who's coming up to Jerusalem, is the very one about whom we have been singing, we personally and our forefathers, at the Passover for years and decades and generations. Because, as I said earlier, the Hallel Psalms, Psalms 113 and 118, were traditionally sung. And as you get to the end of that last Psalm, Psalm 118, it says, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And we found him. It's Jesus. The people are rejoicing because of who Jesus is and of what they believe he is going to do. He's going to bring salvation. Now, what did they mean by salvation? That's a question. But the word Hosanna, found in verse 13, means save now, we beseech thee, O God. Save us. Save us, Jesus. Save us, God. God, save us through Jesus just to put some of the parts together. And Jesus, as king, he's going to save us by bringing in his kingdom, because you can't have a king without a kingdom. 
In fact, Mark 11, verse 10, has the crowd saying accurately too, blessed be the kingdom of our father David. The kingdom Jesus is going to bring, this kingdom, including us, the kingdom spoken of in the scriptures, the Old Testament. All of these threads are coming together. They're focusing on Jesus. Now, so far, I've just been putting together the surface reasons why the Jews did and said these things in our text. Now we need to widen out and go deeper. A little bit of history. The messianic expectations of the Jews, they're based on Old Testament prophecies. The people have been thinking about these things, praying about it for years and even a few centuries. Then comes John the Baptist and the messianic expectation is ratcheted up higher. He has proclaimed the Messiah is coming. I'm standing at the door. I'm going to baptize him. And the kingdom of God is near. Then comes Jesus Christ himself teaching and working miracles. And the people realize God is acting in him. And then we return to Lazarus because he's there in the background in all of these two chapters, 11 and 12. He has raised Lazarus just a few days ago. His greatest miracle, which created the biggest stir. And we're boiling here. We're reaching fever pitch. And then we have an alignment. All the stars that were lining up. We have a, a special alignment of place and time and public mood. When you've sort of got combustion. The whole thing's about to explode. The place is Jerusalem. The capital city, the city of David, Israel's greatest warrior king. And Jesus is coming there. The time, it's feast. One of the three great pilgrimage feasts. The feast of Passover. So lots of people are there. And the Passover speaks of exodus from Egypt by the nation of Israel. Something really important is going to happen regarding us, the people of God. In this place, at this time, and the public acclaim was the highest ever. Pro Jesus, in terms of numbers, the vast crowds, and enthusiasm. And everything is lined up, that's what the people are thinking, for Christ's coronation and the establishment of the kingdom of God. And these Jews, they're excited about this. They think this is a good thing. And here Jesus has got the power and he's got the backing to take over Jerusalem and to rule the promised land and then some. And so the crowds are welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem, come into the capital city, take your throne. And they're filled with joy and they're shouting and encouraging him. Go for it. We're right behind you. They're covering the crowd, the, the road, with their garments. We support you. You are our man. And the palm branches, the palm branches are symbolic of victory. And a very nationalistic sort of victory a victory for israel and there's a quote on the bulletin that makes that point you can read it later at your leisure and we have another longer more detailed quote that will be going online proving this that for the jews the palm branches at that time in terms of coins and historical events and important people symbolized victory for israel so they were cutting down those branches of putting them in front of Jesus. And so we're to associate this event, because remember now, the crowd knew the scriptures as something like, only greater, David's coming up to his new capital city to be crowned in 2 Samuel 5 
or David's son, Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 1. Let me read part of verse 39 and 40. All the people said, after Solomon had been anointed and the crowd was there, all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him. And the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth rent with the sound of them. And these Jews are thinking, this is what we've got here. Like David coming up to take us new capital city and Solomon just being crowned and there's a procession it has come it has come and we are here to witness it and the people are also thinking that this Messiah promised in the scriptures the coming one is surely greater than both David and Solomon he is surely a greater warrior king than David who won all those holy wars and mind you, he's just raised Lazarus. Imagine if we have a king who's a greater warrior than David. And let's say he can, he can raise from the dead any soldiers of his that, that are struck with a mortal wound. This is it. Our dreams are coming true. And Solomon, Solomon had a greater kingdom and empire than David. And then this Jesus, he's a greater figure his kingdom will be greater in glory and wealth and peace and power and prosperity and probably even in extent. And it's all happening right now. We don't just read about it in the old scrolls that this was the case 1,000 years ago. We are living and we're going to behold it and we're going to drive out the Romans. We're going to drive out the Romans and we hate them. And we have good reason for hating them. And it's it's our day. Now I'm not saying that everyone in the crowd joined all of the dots in this way and that everybody had exactly the same idea because after all, it's hard to assess the psychology and thoughts of a crowd. And the crowd contained some true believers as well as unbelievers, but the believers were undoubtedly in the minority and amongst the crowd, there would have been a range of opinions and not everybody would have been as clear. But from this passage and parallel passages and from the Gospels in general and from the extra biblical material dealing with this period, it is undoubtedly the case that the nationalistic, the political and the military predominated in their thinking. And that's why everybody could shout and cheer and rejoice they were into it but as i indicated earlier not everyone that day was of the same mood the crowd <coughs> jubilation summed up their emotions the pharisees on the other hand despair doom and gloom the crowd was happy with the events especially the way they interpreted, largely wrongly interpreted them. But the Pharisees were deeply unhappy. They were grieved by the very fact that Christ, in this instance, was wildly popular. They say in verse 19, Behold, the world is gone after him. Everybody's following him now. And by the way, the word world or cosmos here is just one of many, many instances where it certainly does not mean every man head for head. And the Pharisees were exaggerating and they knew they were exaggerating, but they knew that the world doesn't mean everybody head for head, the old Arminian error. The Pharisees were thinking like this. This crowd is pro-Jesus. Other crowds at the Passover will join into the Jewish people will follow him I can see the way it's going all the Jews in the diaspora and of course their despair was born significantly out of their envy why does he get the big crowds and I don't 
That's what they were thinking. And envy is a key factor in the motivation for Christ's crucifixion. Behold, the world has gone after him. Perceive ye how we prevail nothing. We've been planning and plotting to do him down for years. And all of our schemes have failed. We tried to trick him with hard questions to trip him up. And he always had the answer for us. The sickener. That's how they looked at him. We've run him down to the people and called him all sorts of names. And no matter what we do, he's Teflon. It all seems to bounce off. Nothing sticks. And now, despite our best attempts or running out of things that we can do to him, he's actually more popular than ever. And he's only going to grow in influence. And then, this was the problem for them too, not only their own personal popularity or lack thereof, but then there's also this, chapter 11, verse 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe in him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. There'll be some sort of an uprising. The Roman legion will move in, and then, then our sort of world will be ruined. Despair. That was their reaction. And now we need to see, having looked at the crowd and the Pharisees, that our Lord Jesus Christ is fully in control of the whole situation and every aspect of it. Obviously, he's fully in control of his emotions. The crowds, they're filled with joy. But for a significant aspect of it, they're rejoicing for the wrong reasons. The Pharisees are filled with despair. They're all cast down. But Christ understands exactly what's happening and why. And he's not getting carried away. He's in control not only of his emotions, but of his enemies. Many enemies. Powerful enemies. People who are wanting and even plotting to kill him. And if you think it's hard to control your children, and it is, it's even harder to control your enemies. But Christ is in control of all of them. And he's even in control of the crowds. And it's very hard to control crowds. And that's one of the reasons why you know, civil governments or passers-by are very wary of them. Because crowds can have a life of their own. Especially when the crowd is large, emotional, shouting, and it has the wrong ideas, just like our passage. But Christ's control of the whole situation is shown especially by something that we've only just touched upon so far. How did he enter Jerusalem? Think of the options. He could have walked into Jerusalem. That's the way he entered Jerusalem all the other occasions. And in fact, Jesus walked in all of his ministry. He didn't ride in chariot. He could have gotten a horse, but he didn't do that. More on that later. He entered Jerusalem very deliberately on a donkey or an ass. And of course, there are various ways in which our Lord could have acquired a donkey. He could have bought one. He could have acted directly to acquire one, but he's in control. He sends off two of his disciples. He tells them, there's going to be an ass, just, just what I tell you. And if anyone asks you, and I know they will, this is what you've got to say to them, that the Lord hath need of them. And once they hear that, they'll just say, sure, take him away. And it all happens exactly the way the Lord says. And Jesus chooses an untamed ass, one which had never been ridden on before or broken in. And Christ rides this donkey and it submits to him without any balking. And we all know that donkeys are normally extremely 
contrary creatures, and the Lord, he's in control of the, monk, the, the donkey, and it just rides perfectly and comfortably with him into Jerusalem. Why then a young donkey? And John 12 verses 14 and 15 tell us that it had to be so because Jesus understood the scriptures and willed to fulfill them. Jeremiah, Zechariah 9 verse 9 said that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem sitting upon the colt of an ass. Nobody else was thinking of that, but Jesus was. But it wasn't merely that this had to be fulfilled as if a box had to be ticked, because at a deeper level, the donkey, and now we're getting to the heart of it, the donkey was chosen as a way of revealing what sort of a savior and a king he is, and what sort of a salvation and a kingdom he would bring. And this is the contrast between a horse and a mule. The horse, amongst other things, because they have various purposes, good purposes too, a horse would be what you would ride upon if you were going to war, because the horse was the most powerful beast for such things. And I can point you to all sorts of scriptures as well as your own knowledge of history to make this point, but I think it all necessary. Whereas an ass is a symbol not of war, but of peace. And compared to a horse, an ass pictures lowliness. And I didn't just make that up, because Matthew 21 verse 5, quoting Zechariah 9 verse 9, the very passage Jesus was thinking of on that day, contains this line, meek and sitting upon an ass. That is, Jesus is meek and lowly, and he shows this by sitting upon an ass. And this was clear for anybody that day or since with eyes to see. The problem is that there were many who did not have eyes to see what was going on. The crowds, they're rejoicing in Jesus, but they're not rejoicing in the real Jesus. I mean, Jesus was really there, but they didn't understand who he really was. So they're rejoicing in a false Jesus. And they're rejoicing in this kingdom and salvation which Jesus is going to bring, but not the one he actually did bring. And the Pharisees, they are despairing, and they have good reason for their despairing, but it wasn't actually the reasons that they thought either. But neither of those two groups, the crowds or the Pharisees, grasped the significance of the cult that we're looking at all the other people that were listening to the shouts, but they didn't grasp the one thing that especially revealed what was going on, the donkey on which Jesus was riding. They didn't see that this was the fulfillment of Scripture. They weren't thinking. This is Zechariah 9, verse 9. And even more importantly, they didn't understand the cult to be indicating the nature of the king and his kingdom. And if you're thinking, but I bet you the disciples understood, you'd be wrong. Because they didn't understand the cult either. They weren't thinking, though they've read it enough times, they weren't thinking of the book of Zechariah and chapter 9 and that bit in verse 9 about the king and the donkey and the kingdom that he would have. It just wasn't there. Verse 16 says, these things, especially now referring to the donkey of verse 14 and the fulfillment thereby of Zechariah 9 verse 9, these things understood not his disciples. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things 
unto him. At this point, that there were things that happened in the life and ministry of Jesus that the disciples didn't understand at the time. It's one that's often made in the gospel according to John, chapter 2, chapter 11, here chapter 12, chapter 18, chapter 19, and then after Christ rose from the dead and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, then they remembered what had happened and then they remembered the scriptures and it all clicked with them. Just as Jesus had said in John 14 through 16, when the Spirit has come, he'll bring all things to remembrance what I've said to you and he will lead you into all truth. And now we here this morning, we live after Pentecost, 2,000 years after Pentecost, we have the full scriptures and it's all laid out in front of us. The entry of Christ into Jerusalem. He rode upon a donkey. And this was a fulfillment as verse 15 says. Fear not daughter of Zion. Behold thy, come, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And the disciples didn't understand at first. But they understood later. And then we look at a passage like this. And we say yes. It's dealing chiefly with Christ as king and his kingdom. Matthew 21 verse 11, the crowd shouts out, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. They understood he was a king and a prophet. And now we, with the full scriptures, with scripture interpreting scripture, the new interpreting the old, we understand that Jesus was also a priest. They missed that. The people did in John 12 and throughout Christ's ministry in general. A priest. A priest who was going to offer a sacrifice. That's what he was going to do in Jerusalem. Not seize a throne and stage a rebellion. But offer himself a sacrifice for sins on the cross. Because it's Passion Week. This is Palm Sunday. On Thursday, a few days later, Jesus is going to institute the Lord's Supper. This is my body, which is broken for you. And this cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you. Which he then would do in reality, not pictorially and sacramentally, the next day, Friday, by laying down his life for the sheep. But on the Sunday, the Sunday after the Sunday in John 12, he'd rise again from the dead. They were right, the crowd was. He's a king, he's bringing salvation. But the salvation lies for us in the deliverance from our sins. Not, not from political oppression. And the salvation brings peace with God through being justified in Christ alone. His sacrifice, the forgiveness of all transgressions. Which brings us to the Lord's Supper. And all of this tells us that the palm branches that we, not literally now, but we cast before Jesus, deal with a different sort of victory for a different nation, the people of God. The victory which we celebrate and the claim and the joy which we have in Jesus Christ is the right one and not the one of the sadly mistaken crowd in John 12. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou would open our eyes more and more to the wonder of the scriptures, their unity and truth and power, and to the wonder of Jesus Christ our Lord, always in control and achieving and fulfilling thy perfect will in our salvation. Cleanse our sins and humble us through the work of the meek and lowly, though now reigning Christ. Amen. <clears throat>